I am your host, Nicole Will, and we're so happy you're here as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside older adults, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversations. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. A cancer diagnosis can bring a myriad of emotions, not only as a patient, but also as a care partner. Cancer also deeply impacts our relationships. My guest today is Cynthia Hayes. She is the author of The Big Ordeal, Understanding and Managing the Psychological Turmoil of Cancer. Through her own story and work based on interviews with hundreds of cancer patients, as well as experts including oncologists, psychologists, exercise physiologists, and even neuroscientists, she takes these insights. Based on these interviews and stories, she brings us Mm -hmm. into the chronological progression of the emotional turmoil typically experienced during cancer. We examine important questions as it relates to the relationship between the patient and the care partner. Each chapter covers a particular phase in the process from diagnosis through treatment and progression reoccurrence and recovery. You will find that you are not alone. Cynthia shares the wisdom of those who have gone before us. What should a care partner understand about the emotional experience of cancer? Why is emotional health not yet a mainstream concern among oncology practitioners? How do these emotions affect the patient? The science behind how our brains and bodies process all of this information coming at us. We look at how it can change the relationship with our friends and loved ones and how cancer can also alter physically intimate relationships. As a care partner, how do we balance our own emotions and needs with those of the patients? How we can support our loved ones in recovery, what the new normal looks like, and where we can find more information and support. Here is my interview with Cynthia Hayes. Hi, Cynthia. How are you? Thank you for being here. It's so good to be here. It's such a pleasure to uh, to be with you and to be able to talk about uh, all of the things we have to talk about. <laughs> I know. I am looking forward to it. I had the opportunity to read your book, The Big Ordeal, Understanding and Managing the Psychological Turmoil of Cancer. And man, isn't that what it is, right? Oh my goodness. It is such a big ordeal. And I think, you know, you could add an expletive in there if you wanted to, but right. <laughs> it's not a lot. <laughs> we go, we all go through it, whether we are the patient or the loving partner or family member, a coworker, cancer really rocks our boats and uh, it, it impacts all of us. You know, something like 40% of us will get a cancer diagnosis over the course of our lives and the rest of us will be there to help pick up the pieces. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a universal thing. And your book really, I think, highlighted for me just how much it impacts not only the person that's going through it, but really everyone else and that it is so, so hard on relationships and all that we go through. So just a really good picture of that. Well, I'm glad that that uh, the picture came um, mm-hmm. through loud and clear. I think that it's, it's surprising, I guess, because of the emotions. It's not just that you know, I as a patient, I'm afraid that I'm, I'm going to die, but I as a caregiver am worried about you. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we tend not to share all of our fears and, and every emotion in a situation that's that intense. And it just, it allows a little wedge to grow in, in even the closest of relationships that then yeah. when you layer on not feeling like yourself, not thinking like yourself, maybe radical changes in your body chemistry, all of those things, which influence our emotions and yeah, relationships really take a hit. They do. And you have come to this because of your own story and you saw patterns and how we all respond to the big ordeal. And we've learned from the wisdom of those that have gone before us. So first, can you share with us more about what brought you to write this book and and your story? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, my, my story was a, a surprise one. I had gone for a regular gynecologic checkup and, you know, had no symptoms, no, nothing felt good for 
uh, my age and doctor sent me off with a be sure you're back next year and a week later I got a phone call and I was just you know I was walking down the street uh, my daughter and I were in between appointments to get our hair done and our nails done for a big uh, whoop to do we were going to that night and when the doctor called I assumed it was about a billing issue and answered the call totally nonchalantly and she said Cynthia, you have flunked your pap smear. I need you back in for more tests immediately. What? <laughs> and then wow. she mentioned, you know, the type of cells that they found and the reason she was concerned. And then she signed off. She was in the middle of delivering a baby. And she said, you know, just, you know, get back in here as soon as you can for more tests. And I got to the, uh, the manicurists and I had a few moments to Google what she had just said. And I just panicked instantly. I, you know, I saw the name of those cells and it was connected with a form of highly aggressive uh, cancer that meant instant death as far as I could tell. Right. And of course the, the panic set in. So my hair and nails looked great that night. But oh, the fear and panic was there. Yeah. My face. <laughs> Oh. Um, and and I was lucky. My cancer was caught very early, and it was a highly aggressive type of cancer, uh, which meant radical surgery and a total hysterectomy, and then six months of chemotherapy. But you know, I recovered. I lost all my hair. I lost all of my energy. I lost my ability to eat. I mean, all of the things one associates with uh, a cancer diagnosis. But it was when I was at the gym, bald no eyebrows, just clearly looking like a cancer patient, mm. sitting on a bicycle, trying desperately to get the wheels of that bike to move. And a total stranger comes and sits down beside me and starts telling me his cancer story. Well, obvious that I was a cancer patient, but I had no way of knowing that he was a cancer patient. Wow. And he started talking about his melanoma, which had occurred 15 years earlier and his surprise diagnosis and his instant panic and assumption that he was gonna die, his sense of isolation that nobody could possibly understand what he was going through, um, his fear and uncertainty, and all of these emotions that he kept mentioning was like, oh, you had that? I had mean, that. Wait, you had that way too? Yeah, and it was just such a surprise that there was this common experience, even though our cancers were so different. Mm -hmm. And the more I talked to other friends, the more I heard that, yeah, that's pretty much it. We all go through it. We just don't talk about it. That's what got me interested in writing the book. It's like, well, if there is a pattern to this, why don't we know it? Why don't we anticipate it and therefore yeah, well. um, be better able to manage it? And it reminded me of a, a book that was really important when I was uh, when I was pregnant with my children. What to expect when you're expecting? Oh, um, yeah. Month by month, is sort of mapped out. Well, this <laughs> is what's going on in your body, and this is how you're likely to feel, and these are yes. some things you should be thinking about. And here's how other people deal with these things. I was like, well, that's all we need. We need a manual for how to get through cancer. So. I set about interviewing hundreds of cancer patients and all sorts of medical experts. And the, the experts all shed some light on it. And in particular, the neuroscientist who helped me understand why some of these things were happening, what these emotions were driven by. And then, of course, the patients helped me round out um, sort of what do you do about it? How do you cope? Mm -hmm. What are all the different ways that mm -hmm. you can make cancer manageable? as miserable as it is. Right, when you're in it, yeah. That is what I really pulled from it too, was you referenced how the journey is super unexpected because for most of us, it really, really is. But there's this roller coaster of emotions that happen but it's actually somewhat predictable, which when we're in it, I don't think we can grasp onto that, that it that it is. And it gave me peace knowing that when this comes up, right, because we know that the statistics that it could inevitably, it's going to affect someone in our life, that there's a guideline. So thank you so much for speaking to that and to removing some of some of that unknown and fear around it. When we're talking about those care partners and they're in it with us, what is it important for them to understand about this emotional experience of, of cancer? I think one of the hardest things to understand as a care partner is that the emotions are so volatile 
because of chemical changes in our bodies. And of course, we're all different in how we internalize and express our emotions. But there's a good chance that every cancer patient is experiencing some fluctuations in brain chemistry that are just driving a lot of emotions that surprise the patient as much as they surprise the the care partner. So um, for instance, I learned about a a class of proteins in our body called uh, cytokines. And cytokines allow the immune system to communicate uh, with itself. And there are pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And if you get a little paper cut, the pro-inflammatory cytokines sort of pull the red blood cells and the white blood cells to that paper cut make sure that there are enough platelets there to seal up the wound, make sure that there's extra red blood cells because we've been losing some, we've been bleeding, make sure that there are white blood cells that can fight uh, infection. And then all of that extra stuff makes a little bit of inflammation. You can feel like your finger is a little bit fuller. Then once the wound is healed, the anti-inflammatory cytokines take over and they say, "Ah, okay, go away now, everything's fine. Well, if a paper cut causes a little pro-inflammatory cytokines, imagine what major surgery can do. So our body is awash in this chemical, uh, in these chemicals. And when these chemicals overwhelm the body, they get interpreted by the brain as, as we're sick and we need to go back to bed and mm-hmm. pull the covers over our heads and mm-hmm. don't go out there because there's no way you could, you know, defend yourself against a, you know, I don't know marauding lion or whatever the other, you know, primordial attack was. And our bodies are sort of programmed to respond to pro-inflammatory cytokines with sickness behavior. So that drives a lot of the fatigue. It drives a lot of the depression. It drives a lot of the, the anxiety. At the same time, often chemotherapy will include um, steroids and the steroids help the chemotherapy work. It helps reduce the potential for a bad reaction to the chemotherapy. So it's usually part of the infusion. Mm-hmm. Well, steroids will make you crazy because, you know, as the steroids enter your body, it gives you a, an overwhelming sense of energy that you can fight off anything, including you know, the driver in the next lane that maybe you should be a little bit more um, (laughs) polite to. And then when the steroids leave your system a few days later, um, you can feel weepy because you've been on this high and now you're crashing. So we've got those changes going on. And, you know, sometimes the chemotherapy will suppress our natural hormones uh, or surgery can change our natural hormone balances. And it turns out that Chemotherapy and radiation therapy also influence inflammation and the amount of cytokine activity in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's just, there's a lot going on, not to mention just the constant fear of, am I going to get through this? What's, Mm -hmm. what's going to happen to me next? And so that, that drives a lot of emotions that as patients, we have a hard time um, controlling our reaction to. And so even the most stoic and calm and well-balanced person under normal circumstances mm-hmm. is going to be a little um, up and down uh, going through cancer. And that that comes as a surprise to many care partners. And of course, as loving caregivers, what we want to do is we want to jump in and fix things. Yeah. And sometimes they're not fixable. And sometimes what a patient really needs is to hear that everything's going to be okay, because I'm always going to be here for you that no matter what, we'll face this together, that I love you and I am going to help in whatever way that I can. So that really, it changes family dynamics a lot. Mm -hmm. And of course, it can also really mess with sort of the roles that we all choose. If, you know, as the mother of two now adult kids and a husband and a, a busy home, I was sort of central to everything that went on in this household. And all of a sudden, I had to take a step back. Who's going to fill that gap? And, you know, sometimes a cancer patient can have to, you know, step away from a major role that they play and then have a hard time stepping back into that role afterwards because the gap has been filled. So there's just a lot of dynamics that affect everyone involved in the 
Yeah, so many dynamics. That was one of my favorite parts of your book was the science sidebar. What that does is it really gives us a framework of understanding the science behind why our brains and bodies are processing, going through all of this and those emotional responses. It gave me so much clarity knowing that there's like almost like concrete evidence of why <laughs> why we're why we're acting a certain way you know that it's okay this is this is why this is happening it's fascinating and it also helped me reading it i had had a major surgery in december and understanding why i had the emotions that i did or why my body was healing or what what was going on i could really relate to that and give myself a little grace in it too understand all that was happening. Yeah, I think that that's so important because, you know, as a society, we don't really talk about mental health and emotions and, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of positivity, particularly around cancer, but around physical illness, you know, in general, and, and the sense that you need to be strong in order to get well, and, and that it's our responsibility to be, uh, to be strong. And that's really hard as a patient, um, because it, that adds a whole other layer of expectation on top of, oh my God, I've got to deal with cancer and I've got to, you know, always have a smile on my face. Um, and so just knowing that it's not you, it's not a sign of weakness, but rather it's an expected side effect of the whole thing. You know, it's like you break your leg and your leg hurts. Everybody accepts that that's normal. Well, right. you get cancer or you have major surgery and your body is telling your brain you hurt you know, go back to bed, um, be emotional, be weepy. That's normal, but nobody talks about it. And so we don't know that it's normal. And I think that one of my goals in, in writing the book was to sort of help to validate the emotional experience mm-hmm. so that patients can feel a little bit better about themselves, that it's not a sign of weakness that they feel this way, but it's mm-hmm. an expected part of the process. So true. I was surprised to hear that emotional health isn't that mainstream concern among oncology practitioners, or even I would say then maybe general public in general, particularly you had referenced in those outpatient settings where we're going in to receive those treatments and coming home. Why is this? That's such an excellent question. And and I think it it's a it's there for a number of reasons and I think sort of baked into our healthcare system. You know, our our doctors have become such specialists that you know the the people who are treating us are experts in a particular type of cancer and probably even a particular type of treatment for that particular type of cancer. And they're just far enough removed from seeing the whole picture, just far enough removed from being able to think about the emotional impact and maybe far enough removed from even having had the opportunity to understand why the emotional impact. My first step in trying to write this book and do the research was to ask my doctor, well, why do I feel this way? And she said, I have no idea. <laughs> you know? yeah. I really don't know. And it's not that no, none of her other patients had ever felt this way, but rather that you know, she's focused on this body of knowledge over here on the right. And there's this whole other body of knowledge over here on the left that is just, you know, not one that she has the luxury of investigating and studying and, and relating to her patients. And then, of course, most of our doctors don't want to go there. And, you know, particularly given they have 20 minutes per patient or whatever the requirements are of our healthcare system, it's very hard to be able to ask a patient, how are you doing emotionally and not be ready to spend 45 minutes to an hour listening to the answer and helping the patient sort through that answer. So, you know, there, there are tremendous resources for patients, but because we don't know that it's okay to feel this way, we don't know that those resources exist and we don't know that it's okay to ask for them. And the same with, with caregivers. And I think that there are fewer resources for cancer caregivers than there are for cancer patients, but many of the organizations that support cancer patients also support cancer caregivers with one-on-one counseling, group support, 
uh, information sessions. Um, and now in this day of Zoom and video recordings, everybody has a library of discussions and presentations that are just so helpful. Mm -hmm. So even if you can't get to you know, an in-person conversation, you can hear from other people either you know, live or um, remotely about what's going on and why it's going on. So yeah. tremendous resources out there, but. Oh, that's good to know. Right, right. And know where to go. Yeah. One of the sentences that stood out to me was, if you assume you're going to die, you focus on the dying and not living. And for many people and all those complex emotions, we go to that death sentence first, I think, when we hear that, and that's so scary. How do we overcome that a little bit, and how do we take that anxiety and fear that are going to be with us and... I don't know if it's, I don't know if reframe is the right word because we've got to be in it and acknowledge it, but how do we start focusing on the living a little bit more? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. And I think that for millennia, cancer has been a death sentence. And I think that cancer equals death gets reinforced in you know, the media and you know, the books we read, the TV we watch. It's just, it's there in the ether. But in fact, you know, survival rates for the most common cancers have dramatically increased, particularly in the past um, 10 years. I mean, there's just so many new cancer treatments available and so much more early detection going on. Um, so for most people, a cancer diagnosis is not going to be a death sentence. And so one of the hardest things to do is to take a deep breath and listen to what the doctor is saying. And I know that, um, you know, in, in my case uh, in particular, um, I was very fearful. Um, my husband is one of those people who was like, well, let's not worry until we absolutely have to worry. Right. Um, but as soon as we heard from my doctor, we got all of your cancer, it was early, you're gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, he just relaxed and he was done. I was like, I still have to get through <laughs> right. six months for the chemo. Do he this. was yeah. able, it was all okay because now he didn't have to worry that I was. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that each of us has our own way of dealing with that panic, but I think it's going to take another generation or so before we don't assume mm -hmm. the cancer equals death. I think it's just, it's going to take enough of us surviving and doing well, despite having had scary diagnoses mm -hmm. for us to sort of unwire that, mm -hmm. that connection. Right. Um, so that means that if we assume we're going to die, how do we turn off that stress reaction in order to be able to hear the next words that the doctor has to say and to get through the next few months? And that's where it really helps to have a variety of coping mechanisms right. at your disposal. And I was surprised in talking with as many people as I did, including um, you know, experts and patients and caregivers, the diversity of ways that people um, find to cope. In general, I'd like to think about there being sort of three different categories of, of coping mechanisms. There's coping by thinking, coping by doing, and then sort of mind-body coping. So coping by thinking means, you know, you're going to apply your best problem-solving skills. You're going to break things down into their component pieces. You're going to focus on one thing at a time. You're going to do your research and you're going to be very rational and use your prefrontal cortex to really think your way through it. Mm -hmm. And that works well for some people, less well for other people. It works well sometimes, less well other times. So coping by, by doing is a really important uh, mechanism. And that includes everything from exercising, which releases positive chemicals and helps to lower the stress hormones in the brain, to laughing, uh, to hugging, to all of these things that can change our body chemistry. Even um, eating a, uh, a healthy, uh, balanced diet um, can really help change our, our, uh, our body chemistry. And that can also help to reduce the uh, anxiety and stress hormones. And then the last, um, the uh, mind-body coping, that includes things like yoga and meditation and prayer and surprisingly singing in you know, a, a group situation, a choir or whatever, knitting where you have to recite the pattern, knit one, pearl one, knit one, pearl two, where your hands are engaged and your body is engaged. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things can again, change that brain chemistry and help uh, and help bring down the stress level. Mm. I think one of the best things to keep in mind 
is just taking a few deep breaths, which just, again, signals to the brain, everything's okay. And that can turn off the, the lizard brain, if you will, and allow the cognitive brain, um, the more developed brain to, uh, to take over. The science behind it, it just is so helpful. It's that, because I think we do go into that fight or flight and then we can get out of control and our thoughts can race. And it was helpful to know that I'm not the only one that goes to the catastrophic right, <laughs> right away. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's not just me. No, 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 no. That's yeah. a thoroughly normal thing um, to get into that fight or fight, uh, flight mode because you have to you have to be prepared in case something traumatic happens. And so we go there and that's helpful if in fact we have to run. But for the most part, we don't have to run. What we have to do is we have to stay and we have to listen and we have to follow the doctor's advice. And that requires us to turn that fight or flight mechanism off. And yeah. And yeah. 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 Be able to a little go calm through music, that. Um, mm-hmm. A little laughter and, uh, and a few hugs. Mm -hmm. a long way to help me yeah the big thing that is what we're talking about today is how it impacts people around us and our loved ones and we'll kind of go into how it affects our relationships and our intimate relationships it's hard to know how others are gonna react to the news when we tell them Everyone has different coping mechanisms and how we need support, how other people give support. How have you found that it deeply impacts those relationships? Like what changes? That's such an important um, thing to be thinking about because our relationships do change as a result Mm -hmm. of cancer. I think that most of us are surprised when somebody has a serious diagnosis, whether it's cancer, stroke, heart disease, whatever. As I said earlier, I think you want to rush in, you want to help, or it overwhelms you and you don't know what to say. And so you run away and you hide, or you say something where you're trying to be relatable, but in fact, you turn off the patient. I mean, there's one patient I interviewed who, you know, he was in the army for years and obviously very brave and, and dedicated soldier, advanced to the ranks. And then he was facing a, a really aggressive cancer. And one of his buddies said, well, we all got to go sometime. It's like, oh my God. The last thing <laughs> I want to hear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh no. And, yeah. you know, I think I've heard a number of stories of relatives that we thought we could count on who disappeared, friends who came out of the woodwork to help. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole range of reactions that people have. And I think the important thing to remember as the patient is that often the reaction people have is more about them than it is about their connection to you or your disease, your illness. It's about what they as friends and family members can or can't do because of who they are. And that while we want people to be thoughtful about how they interact with us, we can't control how they're going to feel. So we, as the patient, have to just be tolerant and forgiving of the shortcomings of those around us. But we, as loving caregivers, can be more thoughtful towards the patient. And one of the things that, that almost all patients struggle with is a sense of self. I lost control of my life. I've, in many ways, I've lost control of my body. It's doing things I don't expect of it. I no longer think the way I used to think, so I've lost control of my brain. I can't control my calendar because the doctor is now control. I'm out of control. And so sometimes people will say, well, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z for you. It's like, well, wait a minute. You're taking away yet another element of control as opposed to, you know, I noticed that your grass is getting a little bit long. Can I cut it for you? Would that be helpful? Mm -hmm. Where you're continuing to be supportive of the patient, but you are allowing the patient a little bit of control. I think that's one of the areas where people get most bent out of shape relationships. That and, as I mentioned earlier, the idea that I'm afraid I'm not going to make it. You're afraid I'm not going to make it. Neither one of us is engaging in that conversation. So there's a distance growing in our conversation. So when I say, let's plan a vacation in June, 
you are fearful that I'm not going to be here in June, so you don't want to spend any money to plan a vacation that I can't go on. I'm thinking it's going to be nice to have something to look forward, look forward to, to, aspire to, <laughs> and, and we get into a big fight over we're not going on vacation to, to um, the Caribbean this year. You know, little things can turn into big things because we're both dealing with a set of a, a different set of assumptions. And we're not talking about it because we're afraid of the big elephant in the room. Yeah. I think that that gets in the way of a lot of relationships. Sometimes we don't maybe in our life, right? Because relationships can be complicated, have the groundwork of good communication to begin with. And then we add something really big on top of that. And it just exemplifies what our struggles already are, which can be challenging. I think you're absolutely right. And it does all boil down to communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you also talked about the intimacy piece and the sexuality piece. We a lot of times don't want to go there, but it's so important and a part of who we are, right? It is a part of how we connect and it can play a huge role or cancer can play a huge toll on on this part of our relationships, especially with our partners and navigating that's a whole other ball game. So I'm so glad that you addressed it. How does that part of relationships change in the face of cancer? So a lot of the a lot of the, the chemical changes that are driving our emotions are also changes that affect how our bodies feel and respond to intimacy. Mm-hmm. So you know at the at the emotional level, if I'm not feeling good about myself and I am fearful and I am stressed, and I'm not sleeping well, that's going to make my interest in physical intimacy a little off. Um, right. to, to say the yeah, and for then, sure. <laughs> and then if my hormones have changed, in mm-hmm. addition, I may not be as physically ready for intimacy as I would normally be. And then my sense of my attractiveness, because now I'm bald and I have no hair anywhere, mm-hmm. it's going to change how comfortable I am in an intimate situation. And, you know, at the same time, my partner is like, well, maybe she's not as attractive as she used to be, or maybe sex is going to be uncomfortable for her or you know so that there again it gets down to as you said communication where there's so much more that we need to communicate about because the situation is really brand new and it's brand new because it's layered with all of these fears and emotions and it's brand new because we have allowed a little gap to grow in the relationship in the emotional relationship never mind the, the physical relationship A lot of patients after they've been diagnosed, they don't want to be intimate for a while because they're afraid that it's going to hurt, or they're afraid about how their partner is going to view them, or they're afraid that um, it's not going to feel as good as it used to feel, Um, or they think they have no right to feel good because they're lucky to be alive. Um, So there's a a lot of complex emotions going on in there. And then, you know, a a loving uh, partner doesn't want to impose sexuality on somebody who isn't ready, but might not have the words to ask about it. Um, So there's just, there's a lot of dancing that needs to get done in order to bring that partnership back to where it was uh, uh, intimately. And it can be hard to signal that, well, I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? You know, what steps are we ready for? How do we? And sometimes those happen at different times. One person's ready, maybe not so much. And then there, yeah, it's, it is, you described that perfectly, the dance of it all. You know, Fred Stair and Ginger Rogers, but Mm -hmm. you know, backwards and in high heels. So (laughs) it's, you know, it can be a beautiful dance, but it's got Mm -hmm. to be, um, you need, uh, you need someone who's willing to, to lead and, yeah. um, and start that conversation again. So you talk about the patterns of while it feels so unique to us in the moment, we can identify some similar patterns in the journey. Have you seen that there's one that allows for people to get back on track with the intimacy or is that so individualized? It it is very individualized, but it it tends to relate to when 
physical recovery is happening. And I think one of the things that's really hard is that we tend to look towards the last day of treatment as being, okay, we're done. Mm. But we are so not done. <laughs> we are yeah. so not done. And, and, you know, a lot of cancer centers, they have patients ring a bell or there's some other way of signaling that they've made it through treatment. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot to be celebrated about having made it through treatment. But it can take our bodies six to 12 to even 18 months to recover mm -hmm. from treatment. And we can't get to emotional recovery until we've gotten through that, that physical recovery because that physical recovery is about our chemistry, our body chemistry getting back to, um, back to normal homeostasis. So it's hard to know exactly when somebody is going to be ready. And, you know, of course, we all recover on different time schedules. We all have different treatments that are absurdly bad or only moderately bad for our bodies. Um, and, you know, so that's all relatively unpredictable. But I would say once we get to the point of physical recovery, that's when the emotional recovery and from for many patients, that's when intimacy yeah. seems like. Um, thing again. Mm -hmm. How do care partners balance their own emotional state with then the needs of the person that they're caring for? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think it's, it's one that we all need um, a little help navigating. I think one of the most important things that a partner can do is to find support and someone to talk to who understands what a care partner is going through. You know, it's it's a real challenge. And again, your, your fear of the person you love not surviving this ordeal is enormous. Mm -hmm. But you've also, in addition to that, had to take on the burden of running the household, the burden of keeping the finances together, the burden of, you know, the kids, the dog, the car, the house, the, you know, everything that was shared is now on, on the care partner. And, and that's hard. That's a real lot. And it's hard physically and emotionally. I was like, I, I've got all of this worry for you, but I've got all of this worry for me. How am I going to survive if you don't, if you don't survive? Mm -hmm. How am I as, you know, the, the, the spouse of somebody who has cancer going to get on with my life if, if, my, uh, if the person I love most in the world is, um, doesn't make it? Mm -hmm. So it, there's, a, there's a lot that, that a loving care partner has to go through. Um, and I think that it's just so important to find the resources to help you, um, to have somebody who understands uh, another you know, care partner who's going through the same thing or who went through the same thing, who understands and gets it so that you can, again, feel validated in what you're experiencing. I think it's also important for the care partner to make time for him or herself. You know, as much as you want to be able to give every moment of your day to this person that you love who's struggling, you can't do that if you're depleted. And so you need to go, you know, go on a walk in the woods, go uh, for a run through the park, go and meet your buddies for a drink, whatever is going to be restorative and allow you to come back to the patient with love and support and warmth and care. Um, is what you need to do. It's a good place to start. So as we're going through this and our care partners are in this world of emotions with us, what does that new normal look like once we've come out through the other side? That's such a, an excellent question. And of course, you know, we are all different and find resilience in different ways and, and choose to live our lives in different ways. But for, for many people, there is some element of, of growth that happens through the experience. You know, some people just want to, okay, I want to go back to exactly what my life was before. Mm -hmm. um, but we often find that, you know, we have changed. And so that the life that we had before doesn't quite fit anymore. And some people take that to extremes. I um, know a couple of, of people that have dramatically changed their lives as a result of the cancer experience. Uh, one young woman founded a global cancer organization to help underserved cancer patients find the sort of resources and support that she found um, through her experience. Another woman started a, um, a travel business for cancer patients, recognizing that cancer patients really need a, a way of giving back. And so let's do a, a, a voluntourism uh, thing for, for cancer patients. But most of us just sort of slowly slip back into our lives 
but find our feet walking a little bit lighter on the earth than, than we did before, that, that we see more possibilities. Um, because I think we often feel like, well, we've been given a second chance. Um, and how do we use that second chance? What do we do to help uh, sort of share the benefit of that, of that second chance? That can be hard on care partners as well, because that can require some, uh, some adjustments. Um, mm-hmm. You know, maybe you don't want to go back to uh, the job you always did, and that has a, uh, an economic impact on, uh, on the household. Or maybe you need to be able to give back to others, and that changes your availability, uh, the household as a, as a whole. So there, there are adjustments that everyone uh, needs to make. And of course, we do all find our resilience in, in different ways. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's an interesting part of the journey. It is. And one that really can impact lives when you had said, you know, people literally change their whole lives. It's, I can't imagine not having a new lens on the world, having gone through something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's a great way of putting it. It's a new lens on the world and mm-hmm. um, it, it can make you more aware of the fact that scratch the surface of anybody that you know or love. And chances are there's something complicated going on there that you might not. Right. You know, none of us have smooth and easy lives, but how we choose to, you know, show that to the world um, can really differ. And I think you appreciate it more when you've been through something like this, um, because you realize that you haven't shared with the entire world what you're going through. Um, so it's safe to assume that the rest of the world hasn't shared with you um, what they're going through. We have more, I think, tenderness when we've gone through hard things for other people that are out walking in the world. Where can we learn more? I want to direct people to be able to purchase your book. I thought it was so well written and learned so much. So an incredible resource for people. And you have a website and share with us what how what are you up to right now? Well, thank you for your kind words about the book. The book is available at bookstores everywhere. But perhaps the easiest thing to do is to, uh, to go to my website, uh, thebigordeal.com. There's a lot of information there on the website and um, lots of patient stories to read, lots of insights. A lot of the science that's in the book is there. And, uh, and there's an easy way to purchase the book right, right, uh, right from the website. And, you know, I encourage people to, to take a look just because there are tremendous resources out there. Um, and many of them are you know, linkable directly from my, uh, from my website. There are so many people out there who want to help and are available to help um, both patients and caregivers. And it's, it's unfortunately on us to, uh, to ask for the help. Mm -hmm. reach out for the help that we deserve. Cynthia, thank you. Thank you for sharing your heart. Thank you for sharing your story and supporting other care partners and patients and professionals. It is much needed and and definitely well received. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Nicole. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed our episode, please subscribe and give us five stars. (laughs) In all honesty, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to our episode. Thank you.